And a good afternoon to you from truthandscripture.org. Pastor Rick Averick here. Nice to have you on board. If you are, I do appreciate it. Let me bring myself <clears throat> up onto the screen. Hello, Judy. Nice to have you on board. There we go. Things sound good. Turn that down. Get over here. All right. Let's take a moment of silent prayer, as we always do, making sure we're filled with the Holy Spirit our true mentor, our true teacher. And hello to you, David. We uh, make sure that we cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. We cast all those things that are distractions in the world because we're going about to do the most important thing that we can do as believers, and that is to learn his word, to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. And that's what we <clears throat> endeavor to do here. We also name and cite any known sins. It's not a salvation issue for believers. It is a matter of getting back into the plan of God for our lives. And if need be, and also shifting into academic mode if need be. So we will do those things as we take this moment of silent prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. We thank you for those like-minded individuals, my thought days of yours, students who wish to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. Father, we ask first and foremost that all that takes place here today will reflect your glory and will edify the body of Yeshua. We also ask, Father, that anyone in our congregation going through any trials, tribulations, troubles, temptations, Issues, whatever they may be, you know what they are, Father, and we ask that you just reach out. Bless us. Remind us all that you will deliver us from or through those various things. And you know what they are, Father, and just remind us all that your promises, like you will never leave us or forsake us, and you will never give us more than we can handle. And we also ask blessings upon this, your client nation, in these last days, however long that may be that its leaders make godly decisions wherever possible for the sake of the pivot of positive believers within it and throughout the world. We also ask blessings upon our military, our first responders, and all those who are out on the mission field. We ask it all in the name of Yeshua, and it's upon his merits and the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray. Amen. All right, hello. Karen and Jerry, nice to have you on board as well let's begin we are in uh, the book of mark we're going to do chapter 12 we started it a little bit last time and we will finish it today and then we'll move forward uh i do have a, a message on the spring feast of the lord that uh, i did uh, at uh, gbc grace bible church I don't know if I'll put that up on my channel or if I'll do it again in a couple of weeks or in a week or so as we approach the spring feasts. Um, I'll, I'll think about that. We'll see. I may do it again on this channel uh, with some additions, but we'll see. For right now, <clears throat> we are in the Book of Mark. So, without further ado, uh, that's the only announcements I have next Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. I'll finish with this at the end, but we'll do the Lord's Supper next Sunday. And uh, I'll talk more about that at the end, just briefly. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns, put them up on the screen. E meanwhile, we'll get going. I don't think there's anything else I had to mention. But if it comes to mind, I will mention it. Uh, how's the sound? Does the sound okay? This is a new microphone. Well, it's not new, but it's uh, <clears throat> more of a more of a focused microphone, so it doesn't pick up a lot of the noise around it. So I don't think it's quite as loud as it should be, but I've got it maxed out, so let me know. I'm watching the monitors. They look okay. All right, verse 1 of chapter 12. And he began, this is the Lord Yeshua, to speak to them in parables. <clears throat> a man planted a vineyard. And he put a fence around it. Now remember, 
parables, parabole in the, in the Greek, para means alongside of something. So the teaching in a parable is one thing, but it's parallel or alongside of something else, right? So many of the parables that the Lord did are fairly easy to comprehend and understand. And the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they should have known it. And in many cases, they did. They simply rejected it. And the same is true with believers today. God's word is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And believers that listen to things and are confronted with a change that's necessary in their thinking or in their lifestyles have a choice of either accepting it or rejecting it. Here, the religious leaders were rejecting Messiah. So, obviously, a little more seriously. But even as believers, we can learn from their mistakes, right? And, of course, unbelievers have the same decision to make as the Lord said in Deuteronomy I set before you life and death choose life so you may live anyway verse 1 again he began to speak to them in paraboles or parables the man planted a vineyard and he guarded it he put a fence around it and he dug a vat under the wine press to make everything protected and easy to produce and he built a tower it was well protected. And he leased it to the vine growers and went on a journey. And at harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive his share of the produce of the vineyard and of the vine growers. But they took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty-handed Well, he sent another, and they wounded him in the head, and they treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others, beating some and killing others. A reference to all of the prophets that came to Israel. Many were rejected, beaten, and in fact, Isaiah was said to have been sawn in half with a wooden saw, no less. He had one more man to send, a beloved son, obviously a reference to Yeshua in this parabole. He sent him to them last, They will, he said, respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and put the vineyard growers to death and give the vineyard to others. And verse 10 is... I told you, I think, uh, six or seven times, and I can't remember how many times the Lord in the Gospels, parallel accounts to this and, and others, says to them something like, have you not read this? Do you not remember the scripture? Do you not know? All slaps in the face to these religious leaders who were teachers of the law, representatives they should have known have you not even read the scripture and believe me in their minds that was a slap in the face right then he continues a stone which the builders rejected this has become the chief cornerstone this came about from the lord And it is marvelous in our eyes. Now that quote is from Psalm 118. 
talking about the cornerstone. Let me read verse 12. And they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the people. For they understood that he told the parable against them. They understood the parable. Now, they weren't stupid in that regard. And they were sincere in their religion, but of course they were sincerely wrong. And so they left him and went away. So having outmaneuvered the religious leaders on the question of his authority, remember, Yeshua goes on the offensive by telling a parable that, and you notice the contrast, right? They were questioning him of his authority. And he goes on and tells a parable that, char that challenges their authority. Have you not even heard? And, of course, the meaning of the actual parable. <clears throat> ah, interesting. I'm reading Jerry's comments. In fact, for those who aren't, aren't on the chat, uh, you don't know what's going on there. So I, I will read some of the comments, all right? Because I'd asked Jerry, who's an architect, the other day uh, about the cornerstone. And uh, he said, he says in the, in the chat, um, in relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure that all the other stones are laid in. And, and, I, and I knew that, and uh, he's just confirming that. That's really cool. A cornerstone marks the geographical location by orienting the building in a specific direction. I didn't, I didn't know that. But that's very interesting, Jerry. Uh, and that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I love that. So keep that in mind because this, we'll talk about this for a few minutes. Let me continue. Having outmoved the religious leaders on his authority and his, his authority, they were questioning him. He challenges them with this parable regarding their authority. So he has explained to his disciples that his parables were to reveal the secrets of the kingdom to them, right? And to conceal that message from those who, not because he didn't want them to hear it, they didn't want to hear it. Their hard hearts, their hard hearts, the religious leaders, were rejecting the message. So Yeshua now tells a parable. Parables were used in those days by the rabbis a lot, and I'll explain in a minute. But in this parable that further uh, is a parable that further provo provokes them to want to kill him. The reason that the rabbis used parables, and still do, but the reason they did then, well, they're great learning tools. But the reason they did then is many people couldn't read the scripture. So the rabbis would read it and then tell them a parable that paralleled the story and gave them a, an example, a, an illustration that they would understand, right? So Yeshua tells a parable that reveals the truth to these religious leaders. And they should have fully understood it, and I believe they did fully understand it, or at least many of them did, but they fully rejected it as well. Now, the parable that he tells is actually from the book of Isaiah, and it's in chapter 5. It's the first seven verses. I didn't put it on the board, but I have it in my notes. Let me read it to you. So this is the parable <laughs> that Yeshua is 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 paralleling here, illustrating that they should have understood what was going on in Isaiah's day. Because Isaiah is, is talking to the very, not the same people, the same exact people, but the same exact positions in when he was alive. Isaiah. Look what he says. The song of my beloved about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, Jerusalem. And he dug it all around and he cleared it of stones and he planted it with the choicest vine, God's chosen people. And he built a tower in the middle of it and he carved out wine bad in it. So Yeshua's telling this story from Isaiah 5. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. So 
remember the umbrella of text here is talking about their rejection of what they were supposed to be doing, the religious leaders. They were supposed to be teaching the people the truth as they understood it until the Messiah came. And now the Messiah is there and he should have been finding pr production in the spiritual world, but they were had rejected it. Remember, they had become thieves and robbers, robbing the people, and all because of their greed for power. Sounds familiar, right? But produce only worthlessness. Remember the example of the fig tree. So it, it all fits under that umbrella, which is why we want to read it in context, not just pick one verse out and make a sermon out of it. Sometimes that's fine to do, but, <clears throat> and some people are very successful at that. Uh, I prefer to read it in context, as you know. Uh, and that, that doesn't uh, sit well with many, so that's the way it goes. And now you inhabitants of Jerusalem, continuing now in Isaiah, of Jerusalem and people of Judea, judge between me and my vineyard. What more, and I love this verse, what more was there to do for my vineyard than what I have done? Huh? When the Lord, you know, and I think of that today, what more do the unbelievers want? What more do the unbelievers want? What more could I have done for people than to send my very own son to die for their sins? Make it so that I did all the work and they would have to make a non-meritorious decision to believe plus I showed them all of these signs and they still rejected what more could I have done to my vineyard so now verse 5 let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard I will remove its hedge its protection now this is for Jerusalem in Isaiah's day this is for what Yeshua is quoting in his time and this is what I do believe is America is being warned today. I do believe we're his client nation. And uh, I've taught on that before. Many people reject that, that idea. But we are being warned. We are being warned. And so this is what's going to happen if we don't repent. And by the way, people have asked me, you say repent. How's the nation? How am I, Joe, Joe, Joe Johnson or whatever, how am I going to repent for the nation. I'm not the president. I'm not a senator. I'm not a decision maker. Well, it's just like anything else. It starts with us. We clean our own house. We make sure that we're living the spirit-led life. And then we go to our families and then our households. And then wherever we are in the world, we make sure that we're representing God that way. And that's how it begins. That's how repentance begins. So now let me tell you what I'm going to do, the Lord said. I'm going to remove its hedge, its protection. America's been divinely protected. That protection is gone. It's going away. Attacks at the southern border are just a part of it. And this, this event coming up in a couple of weeks, I believe, is a warning. And I'll talk more about that at some point later. Uh, and I did this morning at GBC, but... And it will be consumed. Look at that. It will be consumed. I'll break down its wall. It'll become trampled ground. I'm going to lay it to waste. I will not be, it will not be pruned nor hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. And I will also command the clouds not to rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of, army, of armies is the house of Israel. And the people of Judah are his delightful plant. So he waited for justice, but behold, there was bloodshed for righteousness. But behold, a cry for help. And that's Isaiah chapter 5. It's what Yeshua is quoting. And there are applications one could make for this country. But I will continue with the text. Yeshua refers to Isaiah's parable. <clears throat> illustration. As the Lord continues the warning to his people who are rejecting their Messiah. Because of the nation's injustice and unrighteousness. God will remove his wall of protection and allow the enemies to conquer. Yeah, and that's okay, Judy. That's why I say I might <clears throat> redo that 
uh, on my own channel. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I mean, I can put it up once it comes out on the, the fluff tube. I can I can grab it. We'll, we'll see what I, I might put it up and then do it again. Anyways, I don't know yet. But but this is a warning of this coming eclipse. And since yeah, I mean, 9/11 was one. I mean, it's, it it goes on and on. God's not going to just warn us one time. But look at this. I just I don't know if I, I showed this the other day or not. I can't remember. Because <clears throat> um, I've been busy preparing. But, uh, <clears throat> but the the red lines are the total eclipses over the last, just the last seven years. Seven years, right? So you got the one that goes from the northwest to the southeast. You got... A little one in 2023 that goes just snips, well, actually right through the whole state of California, I'm sorry, California, and then Mexico. And then you got the one that's coming up that's going to go right through Mexico and then right through across the United States from um, the uh, south uh, east to the north east. Right, so you got... You got this design here, and if you can read pictographic Hebrew, that is, my friends, the Aleph. And it's actually the Aleph and the Tav together. The Aleph Tav. Aleph Tav, the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, as he says he is in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Aleph Tav is used as... Uh, in 6,300 times in the Old Testament. Aleph Tav is a signature of God. It's a signature of Yeshua. And, uh, yeah, one of the theories is that Nineveh is, was, is located in what's now called Iraq. There are several theories. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a warning. And look at this, because I'll show you this, right? In fact, you speak of Nineveh, Karen. It's pretty cool. There's the, this is the, that little, the, the totality path, right? So this this is where it's 100% total. You got the 2017 one running there from the upper left to the lower right. You got the path of 2024 going from the lower left to the upper right. So that the shadowed area in there, the whole area is total darkness for that 2 or 3 minutes, right? But you notice you notice the arrow I put in there, it's right by Evansville, Indiana, and there's a little township there called Rapture. Rapture Township. So Rapture Township has been at the center of both of these eclipses. Now, am I telling people in the Rapture to move? No, not at all. However, Nineveh, of course, there are seven cities that the 2024 eclipse is going to go over in totality now everyone in the u.s is going to see it even down in florida you're going to see it you're only going to see a sliver of it being covered up up here in the northeast we'll see about 93 94 percent so anyway yeah i'm sure there are great christians everywhere now i'm not and i'm not saying hey move move or i'm not saying they're evil i'm just saying I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences. No way. Not you couldn't name a coincidence. God is the greatest architect of the universe. He's the greatest mathematician. And you know, this is something I, I, I always think of as a part of and this is all part of this is not to to scare anybody, because fear in the life of a believer is not in their vocabulary. Why would we fear? I don't I don't I don't fear anything. Only you know what the only thing I do fear is God himself, right? The book of Luke talks about that. But yeah, I mean if you go just the, the totality, I've never seen one in my life. I've been around many partials around the world, but I've never seen a total because in a total eclipse you get what's called the diamond ring, right? The little, it's all blocked out except for the aurora, or, you know, the, the solar flares that are coming out. And then as it starts to, as it disappears and as it goes away, there's a little flash. We call it the diamond ring. 
in astronomy, but that would be really cool to see. But it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. And I'm not saying the world's going to end that day or, or the next day. All I will tell you this is that the rapture is one day closer than it was yesterday. And in two weeks, it's going to be two weeks closer than it was yesterday. So I'm not afraid of it. I'm excited. And I don't, I don't pray for the rapture tomorrow. I got a life to live and I'm going to see my grandchildren and all of that stuff. So, yeah, yeah there was an eclipse. Uh, and I think it was a supernatural eclipse. But eclipse lasts about three hours. Now, the, the totality lasts about three to four minutes. But the total thing lasts about three hours. So many believe it was an eclipse. In fact, NASA runs it. I think uh, they come out with like 30 AD as an eclipse that was in that area, if I remember right. 30 AD, 2,000 years. To get to 6,000, 20, 30, that's why people come up with all kinds of numbers. But, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, you know what, Karen? Because it's so cool. When Nineveh, when uh, Yonah walked into Nineveh, there they say there was an eclipse. So when when Jonah Yonah walks into Nineveh, the king was Sennacherib. He had built a temple in Nineveh, and a beautiful temple. That's why many think it was in Iraq, uh, or Iran, or in that general area. But it built this grand temple Yonah comes in Sennacherib had just lost 185,000 soldiers that the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua killed in a war to protect Israel and that was King Hezekiah who made mistakes but he walks in they knew this guy Yonah of course had just been inside a whale the whale delivered him the Lord had just killed 185,000 of their soldiers, and now there's an eclipse when Jonah walks in. One of the, I do believe, one of the signs of Jonah. And that's why I, this, this, this eclipse is a warning. And I'm not saying anything, the world's going to end, or the grid's going to go down, or anything like that. It could, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, the Lord always says to be prepared, right? But we rely on Him. So, great questions. Great questions. Listen, I don't teach to tickle people's ears. Sometimes what we teach as pastors does tickle people's ears, and that's you know, that's your fault. I don't want your ears to be tickled for entertainment purposes, although I want them to be tickled for spiritual growth. So anyway, where was I? So the vineyard is Israel. The owner, of course, is God. But new characters from the Isaiah illustration are entered in, right? So the, the two have comparisons, but the Lord expands on one in his parable. Yes, Israel is, is Israel. God is God. But there's new characters in the Lord's. There are these tenants, and they're the Jewish religious leaders, the guardians of the nation, right? So you get the illustration. These religious leaders that Yeshua is dealing with, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Her Herodians, they were the gatekeepers. They were the guardians of the word of God. And they had blown it. They had blown it. And many of the guardians of the word of God in America have blown it. And they've gotten into diversity. Calling good evil and evil good teaching or not teaching based on getting people into the seats or hits on a stupid social media which can be good of course but many pastors they won't touch one thing or the, they'll only teach on this because they know it's going to get hits the point is and hey you know, we, we all got to watch that <clears throat> but the point is that no longer the the unfruitfulness of the vineyard is being talked about, right? But the it's really shifted to the unfaithfulness of its caretakers, yeah? And of course, if the caretakers fail to take care of it, you're not going to have any fruit. So they go hand in hand. But the servants are the many prophets whom God has sent, that Yeshua talks about through the centuries, to call Israel's leaders to repentance, obedience, and justice. The beloved son, of course, is Yeshua himself. So in this way, the whole history of Israel climaxing in the coming of the Yeshua is played out in miniature. The rejection of the prophet 
culminates in the rejection of the Son. In the rejection of the Son. And that's where many pastors today, and we all have to look at it, have failed. They failed to talk about repentance. Repentance. Turning away. Turning away from the ungodly, the unspirit-led lifestyles. I'm not talking about the sin. I'm talking about lifestyles. We'll always be sinners. But Yeshua now shifts the story. I shouldn't have shifted slides there. But and the illustration talks about buildings, right? So now we're going to get back to this cornerstone. At one corner of the building, as and Jerry expanded on this, they would place this very big stone, and the other stones are built up upon it. And in fact, as Jerry said, all the other stones are laid in around this cornerstone. You pull it out, and the building could be weakened, or I, uh, I put down even collapsed, I, I would imagine. So in the parable, the builders reject a stone for the corner, cornerstone because they say it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And they throw it out. They throw it out. You know, one of the reasons they would throw out a cornerstone of stone <clears throat> is because there would be some iron in it, and the iron over the years would start to oxidize and weaken the stone. I read a rabbi, and I, I, I apologize for you bringing this up, but it was pretty cool. He, he, he had kind of tied that into the iron in the cross and the nails and the cornerstone being rejected. Anyway, I'm sorry I won't go into that because, quite frankly, I can't remember it all. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. But anyway, a stone which his builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it was marvelous in our eyes. As I said, a quotation from Psalm 118, which is the very same psalm that they were just shouting, not them per, per se, but the crowd was just shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. I believe it's pronounced, people say Hosanna, oh Hosanna don't you is that that, that song but Hoshana, i think it's more accurate blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord so the telling of the parables from isaiah 5 once the son in the story was killed in that story though the end is that's the end of him right he's gone he's gone and i got the wrong slide here but yeshua tells another part of that as well he changes a bit because the very stone, cornerstone that they reject is his, his is himself. That's his Susanna. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Karen always gets all my musical references. <laughs> no, but um, the very stone which they reject will become the head of the corner. It will become the head of a new building. Remember, he said this temple, this temple, it's going to be torn down and. Not in, in in a short period of time, not one stone's gonna be left upon another on this temple, but a new temple there will be, and that's him. He's gonna be the cornerstone, and we're a part of that building. We're a part of that. So that temple was finished, it was fruitless. It's going to be given to someone else. And Yeshua is saying, I'll be the new corner, I'll be the new foundation. I will be the one that's built that that the new will be built upon the new I'll be the new foundation I'll be the new tell me uh, Isaiah 41 10 David I, I can't I don't have it on top of my head I apologize was I quoting something out of that I might have been I don't know <clears throat> but they understood the message they understood it so clearly that they went away and changed their lives no they, they didn't do that they went away and plotted to kill him. They seemed to understand very clearly what he was saying. What was he saying? You are so jealous for your temple. For your power. You are so greedy for the money and the power. You don't want me. You don't want the truth. 
And I'm sure you can see that that's the true feeling of many people today. Even believers as well as unbelievers. The same thing can be said. You're so busy with your greed. You're so busy with your power that you don't want me. You don't want the truth. And even believers, you're so busy doing other things. And that, you know, it's, that's one thing I, I think when you, you talk about eclipses and, and the, the wonder of the heavens, you know that, you know, Orion, Orion, the constellation, it only looks like our Orion to us. I mean, if, you know, you go beyond, uh, you know, Earth, go to another one of the planets and look at it. It's not Orion. It only looks like that to uh, to us. God did that for us. I mean, it's it's different shape, but God did all of that, and the eclipses, because I think sometimes believers get so wrapped up in in being in serving God, and I don't mean this to be a negative, but we get so busy serving God that we forget to honor God. You know. We get so busy serving that we forget to just sit back and be in awe of the God that did all of that. And I, I think it's it, it, for many, many reasons. Uh, but, you know, this eclipse shouldn't scare believers. We should just relax and be in awe. Because man can't create Orion and 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 the nebulas. God, a man can't create an eclipse man can't stop an eclipse all he can do is calculate it based on the perfection of the mathematician of the universe god you know the moon 400 times closer to us than the sun the sun 400 times bigger than this than the moon if that wasn't so it wouldn't be right it wouldn't it wouldn't ever give us that lunar eclipse or the solar eclipse anyways god did all of that and it cost him nothing but for you and I to spend eternity with him, it cost him his only son. Now that should send chills down your spine. But the people who put Yeshua to death were religious people, his own people. The people who hated him were those who were right in the middle of the temple. Those who should have been the first to welcome him. You see, religion and Christianity don't mix. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Religion's always been the enemy of Christianity. Much of what religion is today, it's simply a religion of convenience. I go every Sunday. I pay my dues. I go every... I give to every drive that they do. Poor kid drive, I'm there. Gloves to the to the home, I'm there. But there's no relationship. Anyway. Christian Christianity and religion don't mix. You know, and and uh, you know, I, I just want to, Jerry probably looks at these things and and with a different eye. I I just have so much respect for an architect who could build something. I could not build anything but uh, you know I love like a place like St. Peter's Basilica you know look at the grandeur I mean it's amazing and I got buildings right here in in Fall River that are you know a couple hundred years old or 120 30 40 50 whatever uh, they're amazing buildings but this one St. Peter's you know if you go back through the archives and you start looking at how they built it the, the popes and, and the religious Catholics were selling indulgences all over Europe. So, you know, it was based on the Book of Tobit, which is a terrible book of the Apocrypha. But, you know, Uncle Bartholomew was a little shaky. And so a few hundred thousand pounds or dollars or yik yaks or whatever it was. And uh, we'll see if we can't get him out. Because right now he's stuck. And with all that money, and of course the look at look at the Pope, what a fool, what a what a buffoon uh, that they just they just did it. So they do it every Passion Week. They got people 
carrying around the, the the palm frontons or whatever they are, and they're waving him, and he's blessing them, and he can't even stand up, and there's somebody holding him. And what a nightmare. What a joke. It's not a religion. I guarantee you he has no relationship, none, with the Lord. And I say that boldly, and I know I shouldn't. But Verse 12. And they were seeking to seize him, Zetao, no, Zateo, yeah, Zateo uh, means to grasp, hold of in a bad way, right? Not to, not to hug, but to, you know, be rough with. Yeah, you got St. Bart's, or Bots, yeah. St. Bots, uh, St. Amos, got all kinds of weird stuff. Anyway. Uh, so you know what you know what that word though. Uh, the reason that I mentioned uh, Zeteo, if you look it up, it's the same word. It's the same word that Herod is used for Herod when he was seeking the uh, the the child uh, of Yeshua. You know, so they were they were they were seeking to seize him. It's the same seeking to seize as Herod was doing to the baby, trying to find Yeshua. And what do you think? Herod wanted to do with the baby, he wanted to kill him. So you see the, you see the the tie there, right? Yeah, that's for sure. I'm, Karen said uh, you can bet the Pope doesn't know it's First John one. I don't want to get, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, uh, I don't think he knows First John is even a book. But that's another story. I don't mean to beat him up. I mean, you, know, you got to pray for the guy. He's going to be in hell if if he doesn't accept Yeshua for who he is just like anyone else so they were seeking to seize him but that's kind of a cool word right same kind of mindset that's going on there with those i love the word studies there and they're they're so cool and yet they they wanted to grab him that way they wanted to kill him but there's people they feared the people because they understood that he told he told the parable against them so they were kind of caught in the corner and so they left him and they went away. So this is the third illustration or event we see in the growing controversy between Yeshua and the religious leaders in Jerusalem. After the challenge to his authority to clean, and to, when he was cleansing the temple, he responded with a parable about the tenants of the vineyards, all of them portraying the leaders as evil tenant farmers who stand in opposition to God's purposes for Israel and the proper teaching, and that was all true. The controversies now are going to continue next as the three groups approach Yeshua, each raising questions that challenge his authority. But every one of these things was happening just prior to the Passover. As the lambs were being led in to the sheep gate, as I told you before, they were being inspected for blemishes. That's part of what's going on here is these religious leaders are inspecting Yeshua. They don't know it, but they're fulfilling that role. They're inspecting the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And they will find that he has no blemishes. They don't like that. In fact, all the way through the six illegal trials, the final one will be Pilate, who knows some scripture, because there was a procedure where you would wash your hand in, in, uh, in the blood of, of, uh, of a sacrifice and it would release you from, from certain things. Uh, but, but, but Pilate washes his hands of the whole affair. And what did he say? I find no fault in him. The highest authority in the land found no, uh, no, no blemish in Yeshua. So they were going through the same thing here with all of these questions. So don't, don't just think they're just arbitrarily there. They're fulfilling everything that Yeshua did. He's either fulfilling prophecy or fulfilling the rehearsals, the mikras, the convocations, the mikras, the rehearsals for the real thing. He was the real thing. It's so exciting to see. And that's why, you know, that's why people... You know, they say, well, you know, I don't celebrate Easter anymore. We don't call it Easter. We call it Resurrection Sunday. But everything else about what they do is pagan. I mean, they don't learn the real truth behind the spring feasts. That's why I, I and I've taught on them many times, so it's nothing new that I did today at GBC. But 
uh, that is up on their site, by the way. I'll, I'll see if I put it up on the. But the first question came from the Pharisees and the Herodians. From and it, 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 it's going to concern the legitimacy of I'm talking about the next three things. The next one's going to be paying taxes to Caesar, which we'll see. The second is then the Sadducees' turns. You see, so each one of these religious groups, and they hated each other, but they were all in, in, in agreement with hating Yeshua. So the second is by the Sadducees, and it's going to relate to marriage and, and the resurrection. And then the third is from this teacher of the law, a scribe, who asked about the greatest commandment. Let's see if we can finish it and stop babbling here. As the main groups making up the Sanhedrin, all those groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, Herodians, I don't think the Herodians were there, but they were all under the umbrella of the Sanhedrin. But altogether, I'm telling you, the point is that they represent the leadership of the, the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem and, and Judea. By the way. So remember, at the end of chapter 11, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, right? Now, verse 13, then following they sent some of the pharisees and herodians to him so you see what's going on it's like you know it's like a okay you know a round robin no no tag team thing tag team right uh you know they tap out and these guys come in and they went to him in order to trap him in a statement so we're told that here don't miss that we're told their their purpose when they had come they said to him teacher we know Teacher, didaskalos there. It's not Rabboni uh, or Rabbi. It's didaskalos. It's not necessarily a, a bad term, but it's not the total respect of Rabbi. Teacher, it's not, it's not bad. I'm just noting the difference. We know that you're true. Ooh, hey, we know you're true. You know, and, we ca and you care about no one. Uh, it's really, it's really you, you, uh, you, uh, you don't defer to anyone. Right? It's really not that you don't care for anyone. That's a terrible translation. The NASB misses a lot oftentimes, but uh, that's why I always want to read different ones to see the nuances. And uh, to tell you the truth, I, I, I usually look at the King James. I, I don't say it's perfect or anything like that, but I, I always like to see you know what they how they interpreted it, uh, if it's Old Testament. I'll use the uh, Septuagint, whatever. Anyways, uh, it, this is terrible. And care about no one, that's not true. I think I'm reading the NASB here, am I? I, I didn't mark it down. But for you do not regard the person of men. So you don't, you don't regard the authority of men uh, when it comes to those things. Because you teach the way of God in truth. Okay? Big flattery, right? That's what it was meant to be. Hey, we know you're truthful. We know you don't defer to anyone else. That you got the total authority. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? <laughs> well, are we to pay or not pay? As you see, there's a. They know this is a no-win situation, supposedly. But he, Yeshua, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them. Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarii or a denarius to look at. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now, as we've seen, as we've seen, I can certainly mess up the slides. As we've seen, there were certain groups, the Pharisees, scribes, the chief priests, Herodians, the Sadducees, and the priests. Each group held power in either religious, political, or really both in some cases. Now, the Herodians looked to Herod as a savior of sorts. They really thought he was like a messiah. That's why they were called Herodians. They were, they were worshipers of Herod. And some people try to liken them like to some political group in our country, uh, but the, there's really nothing close. They were total devotees to Herod. And because they thought, you know what, we'll just live under the Roman Empire 
Herod's a Jew. He was an Enemean Jew. He was a convert to Judaism, pretty much for convenience sake, but I don't know, you know, I didn't know the guy, right? But uh, they say, they said, you know, if we just, we'll, we'll just tell, celebrate Herod. He'll, he'll let us live uh, under the, the, the Roman rule in, the, in their land. So, as I said, each group held some power. Um, so Yeshua presenting himself as the Messiah was a threat to everybody, all these religious groups. Well, why? To the Herodians he was a threat, right? Because why? The people had just, just been laying the palm branches down as he came into the city on a, on a donkey, and they were calling for war. That's what the palm branches meant. It's war. I, I gave you. The, I think I gave you the the example of uh, of Yehu who came in on a chariot. Uh, Simon Maccabeus came in on a horse for war, and that's what they wanted Yeshua to do. Remember, take a right and go up to the Romans. So, him presenting himself, he didn't do that obviously, but the people were, were thinking that. Well, that was a threat to Her Herodians and to Herod because then he would have been the king putting the crown before the cross, which, of course, couldn't have been done. But the Herodi Herodians and the Pharisees, they, they made strange bedfellows. You've heard that term, right? The Herodians were opposed to the Pharisees on political grounds. In fact, they were as opposed to the Pharisees on political grounds as the Sadducees were, were opposed to the Pharisees on religious grounds. Right? Makes sense. So it's quite a mess. But they're all in conjunction or aligned with one thing, Yeshua. So the Herodians supported the Herodian dynasty. King Herod the Great, now his sons, was Herod Antipas, the Pharisees rejected any rule apart from a theocratic kingdom under divinic rule. So they actually should have, the Pharisees should have been the first ones to recognize Yeshua because he came from the tribe of Yehuda or Judah, which is the tribe of David, where David came from. So they should have recognized his qualifications, if you would. But of course, he was going to take away their power as well. So verse 14, they came to him. And they said, so remember verse uh, 13, right? The Pharisees and the Herodians are now coming to him. And they said to him, teacher, we know you're truthful. And we know you're a great guy. And we know that you got some authority. You're not, uh, always beware <laughs> when people begin a conversation with you with a lot of flattery. Not always, not always, but that should perk your ears up, especially, I mean, if, if you don't know these people, I mean, it, it's not always that way, but you should know what the Bible says about flattery. And, of course, the song, here we go, Karen, they smile in your face, oh, is that it? But all the time they want to take your place, the backstabbers. Anyways, Proverbs 7.21 says, With her many persuasions, she entices with her flattering lips. Of course, it just doesn't mean here it's a woman, but could be a friend, or could be an enemy, could be anybody. Proverbs 26.28 says, A flattering mouth works ruin. And Proverbs 29.5, A man flatters, I love this, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net. For his steps. They're using flattery in their attempt to trap Yeshua backstabber. So they came to him. Are we to pay or not to pay? That's the question. But now listen, I'll, I'll just give you a little history here. Judea became a Roman province in 6 AD. It was Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, the brother of Herod Antipas who was actually in charge of that area. 
he was disposed by Caesar Augustus because of misrule. He even the Jews didn't like this guy, right? And uh, they went to uh, Caesar Augustus, the emperor, and they said, "Get rid of this guy." And that's how Pilate got his power in that area. Anyway, I think he was exiled into Vienna or somewhere, as I remember. I can't remember. But but the point is, the Jews of Judea are now governed by a Roman rule under the authority of the emperor. And this authority, and now Herod was, was, was in charge of the Jews. He was, it was a position. But the people were required to pay taxes to Caesar, to the emperor's treasury. Now, the poll tax... And that's what it was. It, it sparked a, a revolt later by a man by the name of Judas, by the way, uh, Judas the Galilean. And the revolt was quickly put down, and many people died. But the tax remained a big point of conflict all the way up until the time of Yeshua, uh, obviously. Now listen, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all viewed as a threat, as I said before. But let me get a good skip here. Uh, the, so talking about this uh, tax is where I wanted to get to. But the Pharisees disliked paying the tax, but they did They did it. They didn't actively oppose it. They didn't like it, but they didn't oppose it. it reminds me of many people today. Anyway, the Herodians had no objections to it because they fully supported the dynasty even though they were under the authority of the Romans. But the intent of the question posed to Yeshua was to force him to identify himself on one side or the other, right? Are you for it or against it? And in one way, he could be accused of rebelling against the Roman authorities. That would get rid of him. If he sided with the Herodians in support, you know, then he would lose face with the Jewish people who hated the Roman tax, right? So you see their intent in the question. They didn't really care about the tax. I mean, they, they cared about it for different reasons. They wanted to get him trapped in another situation. He's being inspected, you see. Well, Yeshua, of course, is just a little bit smarter. And he wasn't about to fall into that trap. So he asks them for a Roman coin, a denarius. And what's interesting about it to me is they didn't have to look around for one, right? I mean, at least in the text, they, they had one. I think they had one right there. They knew what he was going to do because he, he was probably going to go this, this route. Um, but they had one. They didn't have to, they didn't have to ask for one. They had, they had one any, in any event. It was stamped with the image of Tiberius Caesar, and he ruled from those times. But it would have been highly offensive to the Jews, because it was against one of the Ten Commandments um, to worship an image. So they wouldn't have had it, but they had one now. You see what I'm saying? So it wasn't like it was a common thing for them to be carrying around. Um, in any event, he asked for that. They produce it. On the surface, when Yeshua says, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God." It seems on the surface that he affirms Caesar Caesar had a legitimate claim. But the point that he's making is, that's fine. But don't forget God's ultimate claim. So, remember Romans, Paul talks about this in Romans 13, very popular verses that people go to when they read this, but... It says, Paul says very clearly, every person's to be subject to governing authorities. There's no authority above, but there's no authority above the authority of God. And those which exist are established by God. And we know that the book of Acts also says when it comes to a point where it's one against the other, where this of man's laws is directly against God's, then you choose God's. Anyway. First Timothy, for our leaders, and this is something that, you know, <clears throat> is difficult 
many times. But God makes it very clear. He's the ultimate authority, and no one's got authority except that God has allowed him to have that authority. First Timothy 2 says we pray for our leaders. That's why I always begin in part of my opening prayer is, oh, and usually in my closing prayer, is usually to let our, God, let our leaders make godly decisions wherever possible. And I, I, I do badmouth there the individual, but the offices, we're to respect those. And I admit I don't do as good of a job of that as I probably should as your pastor or a pastor. But First Peter 2 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And I do believe in that one, you know, and I teach my children and my grandchildren authority. Authority. Authority is very, very important. Very important. And not just to boys, but to girls. Women grow up, little girls with no respect for authority grow up to be women with no respect for authority and make it very difficult to be in a successful marriage. Uh Uh-oh, I'll get in trouble, but... Not that it can't be done. I just, anyways. But you know Romans thirteen seven. Render therefore all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to customs. That's like police officers. Fear to fear. Fear to fear. I mean, there's a a healthy respect and honor to whom honor. That's a very tough chapter. Romans thirteen. I don't like it. But we did we did teach it at one point, I think. Anyway, I know we did. But um, Yeshua, uh, no, but we, but Yeshua never says that they're the same. But he keeps them separate. Verse seventeen, Jesus said, "And pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's." And they were utterly amazed at him. So Yeshua's answer is powerful, not only because it affirmed the authority of both Caesar and God, but also because it. It, 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 would, it would be heard differently by different people, right? Listen, to the Herodians, it could be seen as acknowledging Caesar's authority. To the Pharisees, the Essenes, and, and other opposition groups, it could be heard as a rejection of Caesar's authority. Give to Caesar what Caesar's raises the ultimate question. What is Caesar's? Well, I will tell you this. The universe is are ultimately under the authority of God alone. He created them. There are no coincidences. We live in His plan. If everything is God's, then ultimately nothing belongs to Caesar. And really, when you think about it, like when it comes to taxes and your money, your money is God's money. You're just stewards of it. So we don't use that to violate laws and not live in um, as as good citizens but anything that's against god we don't do that oh boy and i don't want to get down that road because it's not really where i want to go right now but uh, yeshua's response took his opponents off guard that's the point it was simple yet it was profound because we read they were amazed at him All right, some Sadducees, verse 18, some Sadducees, and the text tells us, say that there's no resurrection. I'll do this one, then we'll finish today. We'll pick it up and get going next time. Some Sadducees who say that there's no resurrection came to Yeshua. Now now you got the Sadducees. And began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man... This is amazing. Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and does not leave a child, his brother is to marry the wife and raise up children for his brother. Not quite true, but it's the liberate law. And yes, that part was true, although usually if, if, it, if the first child was a, a son, then that would release him from it, but that's another story. Now that's true overall. But now look what they do. So they start off with the truth, pretty much. Man, okay, he would have to agree with that. So now listen to the absurdity. So now, Lord, or Yeshua, there's seven brothers. And the first took a wife and died with no children. 
and the second married, brothers now, and he died, and the third did the same thing. And so the seven together left no children. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, now that's interesting. Because what have you always learned about the Sadducees? In fact, what does it say in the very verse? Uh, in eight, uh, verse 18, right? Some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. So now they're saying, here's this absurd thing. One brother dies. The other brother marries the wife. He dies, he dies, he dies, he dies, he dies. Seven, the number of completion, seven. The woman dies. In the resurrection, which one's wife will she be? For each of the seven had her as his wife. So they're mocking the resurrection, and they don't believe in the resurrection. So what is God, what is Yeshua going to say about this? <laughs> I love it. Because the, he starts off by saying, you're mistaken. Another slap in the face. It was, I think he uses, I told you about six, seven times that same concept. Probably even more when you include little comments like this. He said to them, is this not the reason you're mistaken? So here's the reason why, why, why you're stupid. right? Here's the reason. You're stupid and here's the reason. You don't understand the scriptures. Wait, 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 we're Sadducees. I'm a member of the Sanhedrin. You don't understand the scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, affirming resurrection, right? You see that? They're kind of mocking it, and he's saying, no, no, that's real. When you, when you rise from the dead, but here's the thing. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like angels in heaven. That was another thing, by the way, that the Sadducees had a big problem with, the spiritual world and the whole subject of angels. It wasn't that they didn't believe in them, but uh, they had some weird concepts. So the Lord hits them with uh, two stones, if you will, or however that saying goes. Uh, I don't even know what saying I'm, I'm referring to. But regarding the fact that the dead rise in verse 26, have you not read in the book of Moses? There's another one, right? Now, you quoted Moses, you guys. Well, haven't you read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush? How God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then he does it again. You are greatly mistaken. Boy, can you imagine their blood's already boiling now? It's like every one of them. The Herodians have been embarrassed. The Pharisees have been embarrassed. The Sadducees have been embarrassed. And the scribes are about to get embarrassed. Then I want to get to if I can, so bear with me, please. Following the challenge to Yeshua by the Herodians and the Pharisees, the Sadducees take their turn. Their goal, same thing, it's discredit Yeshua. And they try it. By trying to show that his belief in the resurrection is wrong. You know, we don't know a lot about the Sadducees. We don't know, what we do know is a little bit from Josephus and from what other biblical text, Scripture tells us their opponents felt about them. Make sense? So we don't know a lot about them. We don't know how they really started. But it, most scholars believe that they came from the priestly families or leadership families, sort of like they were the aristocracy of Jerusalem and Judea. The word Sadducee uh, has been traced back to a Hebrew word for Zadok, which was a priest around uh, the time of David, I think. But uh, in any event, um, I, I wanted to point that out because in the time of Yeshua, they held political power. They dominated the Sanhedrin, but the Pharisees were there as well. But the point is that it's amazing how they all came together against Yeshua, isn't it? You know, when, you, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the Sadducees, they disappear. And it's interesting, when I was researching this, the Sadducees are mentioned only 14 times in the New Testament. And the Pharisees are mentioned over 100. 
So I, I just find it interesting that Yeshua's dealing with these people. All right, let's uh, jump ahead here. We'll be all right. Oh, by the way, this ridiculous case that they're putting out, the basis for it comes from uh, the book of Tobit again. And in the book of Tobit, I think it's in chapter 3. Chapter 4, I think, talks about uh, the indulgences you can pay for purgatory, basically what the Catholics came up with. But I think it's in chapter 3 and then uh, down the road somewhere. Uh, I, I have read through the book of Tobit, but not, not something I would recommend doing. But in that book, in that book, there is a, a story, and I may get it a little mixed up here because it's been a long time, but, and I did not go back and research this uh, again, but I had read it. There's a woman, and I just remember her name, Sarai, and she has um, seven husbands. And they were all related to each other. But each one is killed uh, with a de by a demon. Each one killed by a demon before they consummated the marriage. So that's probably where they got it from, the book uh, of, uh, of Tobit. Or that book, I don't know when that book was written. But it's interesting, there is a story in the book of Tobit. Uh, by the way, that in that book, she marries the son of Tobit. To Tobias, I think. And he survives the wedding with the help of another angel that we... Uh, I, it wasn't Gabriel or uh, Michael. Saint... Uh, oh, there's a saint. Definitely. Raphael, I think. But um, that's, the, that's why the whole mention of angels there is kind of interesting that the Lord p puts back out. Uh, anyway. Uh, following that question... The replies from Yeshua, now the scribes, and let me just finish that one, okay, because I'm almost done. The scribes now come up. And may I, I say this, right? Uh, all the other ones, we were told that they came to test the Lord. They said this to test the Lord. Uh, he knew their inner thoughts about testing him. This guy, I think, was a little more sincere. Eh, I know people argue with that, but anyway, let me read it to you, see what you think. One of the scribes came up and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well. He asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? What's the most important commandment? Now, Yeshua doesn't get into a discussion, but he just comes right out because he knows this answer. And that scribe, I think, didn't, and he's going to learn. The foremost is this. Shama Israel, Shama hear, hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And then he goes on, verse thirty. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now that's from Deuteronomy chapter six. It's the Shama Israel prayer. It's one of the daily prayers so he quotes two passages one from deuteronomy and then another one from leviticus chapter 19 so deuteronomy 6 4 hear o israel shama israel represents the opening words of the shama and that's a confession of faith and it's recited by the jews i and I, I, I know every morning, it might be every evening. Judy, do you know? I think it might be both. But in any event, um, Judy and I have talked about the Shema before. So. But the Shema makes two basic acknowledgments. One, the unity of God. You know, the Lord is one. Yes, the, we agree with that. The Lord is one. He is one person. He is one entity, one being three persons, right? To the relationship of God to the Jewish people. Yeah, both. Thank you, Judy. I, I thought that was the case. God is to be loved completely and totally because He, He alone is God, and because He has made a covenant of love with His people. Yeshua represents that new covenant with us. 
And in that covenant, what happened? Well, Yeshua gave himself to us. And since he gave himself to us, he expects us and demands us to give ourselves totally to him. We want to rely on him. Heart, soul, strength. By the way, from the original or from the original that Yeshua is quoting, Yeshua adds mind, thought. Interesting. But a person's entire being is to is to be with God. I mean, read it. You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I think that's pretty much everything, right? Verse 31. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And that's Leviticus 19. Uh, I, I think it's verse 8. Or maybe it's 18. Anyways, it's it's Leviticus 19. But uh, And so the Lord brings those two together to show that love of neighbor, love of people is a natural by byproduct of loving God. If you have true love for God, you're going to love people. Now again, God loves everybody, but he doesn't love sin. So people have asked me, how, and I had a, a, a discussion. Somebody actually said, God can't love the fill in the blank the adulterer god can't love the muslim the, the 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 whatever right but the axe murderer whatever i don't mean to make fun of that but uh god loves the person but not the sin and you have to understand that separation now that love will not save a sinner from hell if the sinner doesn't repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ or Yeshua. All right, anyways, verse 32. And the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you've truly stated he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is the scribe now, is much more, much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Yeshua saw that he had answered intelligently or correctly, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And then no one dared ask him any more questions. Only the book of Mark records that favorable part there about you're not far from the kingdom of God. The additional statement by the teacher of the law that love of God and neighbor are more important than all the offerings and sacrifices has many bases in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 15, Isaiah 1, Jeremiah 7, I have a bunch of them I don't have to game, but my point in that is it showed this scribe had some pretty good knowledge of the Word of God. And so Yeshua pays him a compliment. The, the scribe does stop short of saying that the sacrificial system should be abolished, but he does say it's secondary when compared to the other things noted. Anyway, Yeshua has been questioned by the Pharisees, the Herodians. He handles them. And then the Sadducees about the resurrection. He handles them. And now the scribe or the teacher of the law, and he handles him as well. One of the scribes, the teachers of the law. And uh, these scribes appear uh, pretty regularly in Mark's gospel. And... Uh, Usually it's with the Pharisees, which I find interesting, but I don't have an answer for why. But this, the, the scribes in the book of Mark, this is really one of the very few times in the New Testament that they are painted in a fa fairly favorable light here, right? In interesting that that's the case. I'm just reading some comments here, but yeah, that's Leviticus right there. Is that Leviticus uh, 19? Yeah, that's 19, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, all right, so the teacher of law asked that question. You know, later, it, I think I, just let me show you this one slide and then, and then I'll close. I don't think I have it. Yeah, I do. Look at this. 
the, what's, what he's asking this, right? Because later on, or at that time, the la, uh, is, that's chapter 17? Oh, yeah, verse, verse 17, 18, yeah. Anyway, uh, the rabbis counted 613 individual statutes in the law. And it's interesting, it's interesting uh, that that uh, uh, reduces itself down to uh, uh, some, uh, I don't want to get into that, but 365 are negative and 248 are positive. Um, all right, let's close in prayer. Before I do, let me just say this, that, you know, today I was thinking this as, because our mission, uh, oh, thank you, Karen, our mission, our great commission that, that we were given by the Lord is to preach the word of God to a lost and dying world. And it's something I, I do occasionally on here. Uh, is to given what we would call an altar call or to put out the the gospel. But I think it's important. And I was just thinking today about the eclipse and the power of God and the stars and all of that, as I said in the opening, cost him nothing. Nothing. And what a what a what a great way to witness to someone, isn't it? You know? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, on Yeshua. He did all, God did all of that, it cost him nothing, and yet for you to live with him in eternity cost him his only begotten son. So, if you've never believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you're hearing this message in, at any time, in any realm, I'm here to tell you that God died for your sin, for your sins and the sins of the whole world. But if it was only for you, he would have done the same thing. That's how much he cares for you and loves you. And you, without him, are a sinner and you will go to hell and spend eternity there. There is only two choices, eternity in heaven with the creator or eternity in hell without him. And he makes it so simple. You were born in sin and you can call that unfair or whatever, but actually I've got good news. Because you were born in sin, the solution is right there. God provided it. It's to believe upon the Lord Yeshua for your salvation. And that begins by repenting. Repentance must accompany salvation. You must repent of your sinful ways. And so you can say in the privacy of your very own soul right now, without anyone hearing it except the Lord himself, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I repent of my sins. I turn from my own plans to your plan, Father. I want to be in your plan. Give me the faith to live in that plan. And I believe in your Son, Yeshua. And I believe that if you have said a prayer, where repentance is a part of acceptance of the salvation of God that's been granted to us, given to us. You're a member of the royal family, and I welcome you, and we all do. Get in a good Bible-based program. Learn the Word of God. Grow in His grace and in His knowledge. And be in awe of Him. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We just praise your name. We ask that you just bless this ministry and every ministry that's teaching the word of truth, Father. We ask that you bring us back together for yet another um, day of learning and growing in your grace and in your knowledge. Again, we ask that anyone in our congregation going through any trials, tribulations, troubles, temptations, issues, whatever they may be, that you know what they are, Father. And we just ask that you strengthen us all in those things. Remind us you will deliver them from or through them. And that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. And Father, we just ask that our leaders make godly decisions wherever possible for the sake of the pivot of positive believers. But regardless of what happens, Father, we know that you are in charge. You are in ultimate authority and we are yours and we are in you. We ask all that all these things in the name of Yeshua and the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray. Amen. All right. God bless everybody. Thank you. Any comments, put them up.
or you can write to me, Pastor Rick, K2Rs2Ks at gmail.com. God bless you all. I love you, and I will see you when the smoke clears.